Business.com podcast with Tony Rourke and Kevin O'Clarity. Shitjourbusiness.com, making you money. Share it on Facebook, share it on LinkedIn, Twitter, our blog, YouTube videos. Welcome to the Caesarbusiness.com podcast. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty from O'Flaherty Law. I'm joined by Scott Mathis from Plateau to Peak Consulting and Chris Mayers from iCandy Homes. Chris, do you want to start off by telling us a little bit what iCandy Homes is and what you do? Sure. iCandy Homes is a real estate investment company. We fix and flip single family homes throughout the Chicagoland area. Uh, we've been in business now for about three and a half years. Uh, we've completed over 60 projects. Right now we currently have about 25 projects going, uh, over 11 million in active income that we're putting to work right now, and uh, we're having a lot of fun. I forgot to mention in our intro that our topic today is going to be why 2015, or why right now is a great time to be an entrepreneur. So we'll, we'll get back to that later. I want to hear more about iCandy Home. So. Um, so you say you do a lot of fixing and flipping. What's what's kind of a... Do you do that just for yourself, or do you have... Explain how it works. Can people bring properties to you to, to work with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, you know, when we got started... Um, the, the people that started the company, we all were involved in all these different education companies, traveling all across the country to go to seminars and stuff like that. We'd come home to Chicago and we wouldn't know anyone. There'd be no one here who we could consult with, ask questions to. Um, and so when we finally got started, it took a lot longer for us to get started because we were, we were on our own here in Chicago. And because we wanted to get to know people in our local community, uh, we started a real estate club. And uh, the real estate club, we started it when we hadn't done any deals. And so every month we'd come back and start talking about this is what we've done over the last month. And so, you know, as we start talking about it, we've done two deals, three deals, five deals, ten deals. Uh, people kept coming to us who had also invested in different education programs and said, hey, how can we partner together? How can I learn what you're doing? You're obviously making this work. Uh, I'd love to work with you. So initially we said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. You can come hang out at the office. We've got an office down in Mokina. Um, so we started having people follow us around the office and come to us on job sites and they were asking questions and we thought we were providing a ton of value and after a couple months of, of chaos really with people just coming in and out and asking questions and us just kind of throwing out random answers, they weren't doing anything. Um, there was absolutely no change in where they were a few months later uh, and where they started from when they first approached us. So we realized, um, you know, we do want to provide value to them. and so we have to get a little bit more organized. And so we actually have a very structured joint venture program now where not only we teach them the entire process, but we partner on deals. We provide all the financing for those projects, earnest money, purchase price. Uh, we line up the contractors, architects, everything. Uh, we partner on the deal all the way through, help them manage that project. And then we, we list it with our brokerage on the back end. And after the financing is paid back, we split the profit 50-50. Yeah, wow, that's uh, that is pretty cool. Yeah. So, do, uh, with the, do you have seminars for that now? Is there, mm -hmm. you know, like to, somebody comes to a seminar, what do yep. they expect to hear or see? Or so we've actually got an intro seminar uh, on the fifteenth and sixteenth of August, uh, Saturday and Sunday. All of our seminars are Saturday and Sunday. That is an intro uh, seminar. So we're going to be doing an overview of all the different subjects that we talk about. Uh, we've broken kind of all the aspects of. of of fix and flipping down to, uh, to five classes. So there's um, acquisition and wholesale, uh, rehab, MLS, uh, marketing, and finding the money. So we're going to be doing uh, an in-depth overview of those five classes as well as providing case studies of some of the joint venture partners who have worked with us. So this joint ventureship, if I'm understanding this right, it, what, what do you get out of you know, doing all this teaching, and why not just do it yourself? It's a great question, Kevin. We get asked that all the time. And, you know, there's actually two purposes from it. Number one, obviously, we do charge for the program. We spend a lot of time working with these people. Um, we're actually selective. We don't, it's not like we fill a room and try and sell everyone on the program. Um, we do a lot of free and low-cost events so we can get to meet people and see if we'd be a good fit to work together because we want to find like-minded individuals where our goals are aligned for the long run. Uh, and this allows us to ensure that people know our systems before we enter into a traditional joint venture with them. Uh, we have a, a one or four package program, so you'll either do one deal with us, start to finish, or four. Um, those people who do four deals with us, uh, they, are then, they can then be upgraded to the traditional uh, joint ventureship program where it goes 
from a 50-50 profit split to now it's a 60-40 because we know you know what you're doing. And now you're bringing deals to us that we otherwise wouldn't be doing and you're helping us expand. And what we've actually seen is a lot of the people that go through the program, they like working with us so much, we've actually grown our company by hiring on people that started out in the JV program. This is quite a quite a system you've got set up here. I'm really impressed. And how long have you been doing this for? Uh, the JV program's been going a little over two years now, okay. and we've had over over 30 people that have gone through it. Uh, what were some of the the tools that you used to actually get this started from scratch? Because this is a pretty intricate thing you've got going here, and it's a great business model. It seems really complicated. Mm -hmm. it, I, I don't know how you take the first step towards setting this up. What, what's kind of the story of how you got everything set up? So again, great question. As you go to real estate seminars and learn the investment side of real estate, you very quickly learn you don't learn how to build a business. It's actually a separate stream of knowledge, how you actually bring people in, train them, uh, and grow a company and, and create scalable systems. So we, we of course, hired a business coach. Uh, this business coach we hired almost right in the beginning, and he really allowed us to, uh, you know, he asked us the question, he's like, why, why are you providing all this value to people um, without actually making it structured and charging them for it? Because I don't know about you, Kevin, but when someone gives something to me for free, I don't really put attach any value to that. Sure. And so while we were allowing people to come hang out with us and come to job sites, there, in their mind, there was no dollar amount value attached to that time, so they didn't really do anything with it. So now we see when we charge people for our services, um, which I don't know anyone else that actually does what we do. People do you know similar stuff where they'll hang out with you for a weekend or you know coaching calls, but to actually provide their own resources, their own uh, relationships, and do deals all the way through it, uh, we hold the properties in our entity, and there's a joint venture agreement between us and the JV partner. Oh, I'm impressed. Scott, you, you move in this world a lot more than I do. What, what are your thoughts on this? It, it, it sounds like a really exciting thing. And how do you differentiate yourself from all the other, because there's a lot of uh, different uh, seminars or yeah. classes you can go to and a lot of different people that you know you can talk to that have TV shows. Mm -hmm. Everybody's flipping out and saying exactly. everybody's doing it all. Why, if I came to you, mm -hmm. whatever the money amount is, why would you make me, how would you make me successful at doing it? What, what differentiates you? Exactly. And that's, uh, it, it, it's such a, there's so many people out there that are teaching this stuff. Right. I mean, there's just dozens of big companies and hundreds of little ones. I don't know anyone that's actually putting their money where their mouth is. You will get a million people out there that will want to fill a room for a weekend, charge right. you a bunch of money for phone calls and for, you know, mentoring, but they, they won't do a deal with you. And they won't actually want to continue on that relationship. You see, we have the philosophy that if we're going to spend all this time teaching someone, well, we want to work with you for a long time because now we know what you're doing. We know you know what you're doing. And so when you come to us looking for financing, looking to partner on a deal, looking to tap into our uh, resources network, uh, we, we love that because we know you're competent in your area. And so for us, it, it really is a relationship. The value is in the partnership. When things go wrong, you don't just have someone to call. You have someone who's, who's actually more vested in that deal than you are. Let's say you're just getting started in real estate and you, know, you, you could either pay X amount of dollars to go to seminars here or a similar amount to go to our classes, do our one-on-one -on -one mentor and training, and also do deals with us where we're holding the property in our entity, there's actually no risk to you. We're helping raise the capital. You can leverage our track, our track record to bring on your own lenders to get a cheaper rate, rate for financing. And we're right there. Your, your only requirement as a JV partner is to stop by the project minimum three times a week, provide a weekly Tuesday report that outlines just a one-page Microsoft Word document that uh, outlines what was done the previous week, some pictures, and what will be done the next week and you're required to meet with the GC uh, each of those three days. And you have those people set up. So you give them the people, give everything, all they have to do is go by and check in? So we... And you set interest rates too, that's another thing. So it, it, in your thing, if, if you could do both, talk about that and interest rates. What, what are your interest rates? How do you do that? 
does that funnel down to the person that's doing a deal with you? Yeah, so if, if someone comes to us and they say, hey, the program sounds great, you know, I feel pretty good about finding deals, I don't have any money lined up, so I think you can just go ahead and fund it, I'm not going to put any energy into that area, that's no problem. We'll tap into our hard money, private money lenders, uh, and we'll fund the deal. That'll be at a certain rate. Um, that rate's a little bit higher than, than industry average for hard money lenders. And we do that specifically, so that way if you go out and you find a hard money lender, there's, I can guarantee they'll be cheaper than what we charge if you didn't do that. And as long as we, we can build that relationship with them, we'll use that money. And now that's it. We pay them back. And what's left is split 50-50. Okay. On a side note, how do you find uh, you, you're working in this world and this realm? How do you find a good deal? What's a good deal? What does it look? Good, good deal is 30% ROI. So that's our purchase price. Um, and what is ROI? Uh, re return on investment. Okay. So that's our, our purchase price plus our, our rehab costs plus our holding and closing costs, which when we run our numbers, it's 10% of the after repair value. Gotcha. So you, you buy a property for $10,000, spend 3000 on it, then 13000 is the after repair value. Or is that what it costs? Um, so let's say a property is going to sell for uh, 100 Hundred and sixty thousand. Okay. Well, ten percent of that is going to be uh, just we're going to put in there for holding and closing costs. Okay. Minus your rehab, minus your purchase. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And this is it does, and a lot of this is for the anybody out there listening that may not know what ROI is, yeah. or they may not know what all these terms are and everything. So a lot of it's just for the benefit of everybody listening. So when you when you do a deal, what does a good deal look like to you? The, the best deal you've seen on the front end before you on the front end before you realize how do you find the yeah. deals? Yeah. So initially, when we get got started, as most people do, we wanted that three bedroom, two bathroom, basement, fifteen hundred square foot house. That you know, it's it's in a, a, a higher end blue collar area. There's a, a huge buyer's pool of people that can buy in that area, uh, and and. More importantly, you weren't taking too much of a risk getting in there. You weren't having to rip down walls and stuff like that. It was really just a facelift on the property. Um, well, since, like we mentioned earlier, there's so many people out there teaching this stuff and there's so many people getting started and the banks are loosening up now, so people are getting bank financing to go out and do this. Well, you're just getting outbid. It's really tough to find one of those properties today and actually be able to get a really good return on it like you could a few years ago. So we've kind of changed our focus. Now to us, the best thing we could ever find is a one-story brick 1950s house in a two-story neighborhood. Beautiful. We, we'll, we'll put a second story on that thing. We'll just, these aren't the exact numbers, but to give you an idea, we'll put 100,000 into it. We'll increase the value 300,000. So that's, that's what a lot of our projects now, we're doing additions and moving into those higher end areas um, where there's a larger barrier to, to entry. So not as many people can afford those price points. But just uh, bigger additions so that you meet the square footage or footprint of the other house. Yeah, we, we look a lot at new construction, but because we're not using bank financing, uh, we get killed on our holding costs. So it almost always, or up until this point, it has always made more sense to rehab and do an addition. What are, what, what are holding costs? What are holding costs? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so holding costs are, are your taxes, all the utilities for the property, but those are really not important. What's the most, what kills you on your holding costs is your financing. What's the cost of money? Uh, if you're paying, you know, 12% APR on a, a million dollars, it, it kills you. Yeah. So you're, so you're looking at what it, how much it costs you to sit on it while you're fixing it or maintaining it yeah. or by the time you're done. Mm -hmm. And then how long does it take you to sell it? So yeah. what does it cost in that time frame? And so if you, if you buy it for $100,000, you can sell it for $200,000, you make $100,000. But if in the meantime your holding costs are seventy-five, then you brought it from $100,000 profit to twenty-five. Mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, what, what you see on TV and in a lot of promo, they don't tell you all the numbers. Yeah. They tell you what you bought it for, what you rehabbed it for, and what you sold it for. And then you think that's the profit. Well, there's a dozen numbers that didn't get taken into account. There's so many hands in the pot uh, that you really got to have your numbers tight and there's so many people that, that just get turned upside down on their first couple deals because they don't know this stuff. What are the hands that are important? What are the biggest hands that are in the pot that you need to watch for? 
So if somebody's new, they're, they're going, I don't know what you're talking about, I have no idea. What, what are the ones to worry about more than the others? Because you mentioned interest rates being bigger than the Yeah, so, 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 the, so the big ones, uh, number one, what's the cost of money, right? If you're going to hold this thing for six months, how much is that really going to cost you in financing? Um, another thing a lot of people don't look into is, is permits ahead of time. I hear you know people just getting started they, and they go into certain areas, they don't realize all the loopholes they have to jump through to get permits. Now they're waiting on architects and they got to get a civil engineer out there and there's all these things that they just had no idea they were going to have to do and now they haven't even got, a, got the approved for demo and they're three months in. And, the, and that just kills people on holding costs. Um, then the other thing is we have an exact, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I, I, got, I got this contractor, he's my guy, known him for 20 years. And what happens is you, you get into a project and you, you kind of let the, the contractor be in charge. And he's kind of telling you what needs to be done and how it can be done. And, well, he's the expert, right? He's the guy that knows how to do it. Sure. So, it, exactly. So you're almost allowing him to take control of the project. And whenever that happens you're not going to have the finishes you wanted and it's always going to cost more and take longer. So we have an exact system for how we stay in control of every aspect. We've got 13 documents that we sign with a, with a contractor before we ever get started. Uh, and we go really, really into detail on exactly what these documents are. We provide all these documents to our joint venture partners. Uh, we, we actually set our joint venture partners up so they know everything we do. They have all the documentation we do. They, we've shared everything with them. Our lenders have actually agreed to fund their deals after they've done four deals with us. Um, so really, the upside for, for us is we, we, we obviously want to keep them up. We want, we want them to keep bringing deals to us so the profit splits change and we start giving them more than 50% of the profit after those first four deals, and that's forever. We want to partner with these guys forever, but like I said, it is an exclusive amount of people because we work so hands-on. It's We don't just spend a weekend with them. This is very, a very intimate relationship. Cool. So let's get on to our topic, which is why now is a great time to uh, be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you just go with that. What do you, why, what do you, I mean... I agree with you, but why do you think that was a good time for being out? Man, it, it just gets me so excited. When you look at, at today, the, the opportunity that's available, everywhere you, uh, when you turn on the news, when you open a newspaper, when you, when you go to your social media page, you hear all this negativity and all these bad things that are happening. And I, I got to tell you that, that the world is actually more safe today than it's ever been. There's actually less people dying per year than there's ever been. And you'd never know that if you just watch the news because they find these things that are happening and they put all your attention on the negativity. That's true. Well, I'm, a, I'm a history nerd mm -hmm. and you read about what it was like to live you know, 50 years ago, much less 100 years ago. Yeah. Man, there's no better time, no, no safer time to be alive. You know. Yeah. You say that with a knock on wood for a terrorist attack, but you know, at least we're not involved in any major wars right now. <laughs> right. And it's, uh, you know, yeah. it, compared to World War II, I'll take this, but that's my history nerd perspective on it. No, I mean, <laughs> and, and you're so right. It's not only has it been the has the world been the safest it's ever been, but there has never been more of more money available. If you don't have enough money, it's because you don't hang out with people that have the, that have more money than you. Um, you know, one of the most powerful things I learned is the rule of fives. You are only as good as the five people you spend the most time with. And if you're ever the smartest person in a room, you're in the wrong room. And uh, it's, you know, people go into the corporate world and they start working for big companies because of safety, uh, because they want that sense of security for them and for their family. And, and it's a very logical viewpoint. I don't um, disagree with the viewpoint, but what I'm looking at is the big picture. And, and the reality is the, the world of, of salaries and 401ks and uh, your, your you know, medical, that's, that, that's all history. That, everyone is going to be changed to independent contractors and you're not going to have all you're not you're no longer going to have a company setting you up for your retirement people have to take charge of their life and they have to take risks and they have to go out on their own and make things happen and the reason real estate excites me so much obviously obviously there's you know a dozen industries you could you could pick going into but real estate for me it's 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 physical you can touch it people are always going to need a place to live, and if you can get started now, 
it's it's such a good time. Obviously, you can think, oh man, if I would have got started five years ago, well, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do today from this point forward. So many people have their attention on the past, and they fail to make the right decisions in the present to create the future. Well, what you need to do is quit thinking about the past. You are exactly where you are right now, and that's not going to change other than what you do from this point forward. That's the only thing you have control over from right now is your thoughts and your decisions. And it's up to you to make the right ones. No one else is in charge of your life. Yeah, let's unpack that a little bit because I, I've often been in a position where I'm like feeling sorry for myself and like, you know, things are going hard at work or, you know, payroll was more expensive than I thought it would be. And I'll do a thought experiment where I say, you know what, if I was inserted into this body from, you know, the planet Pluto and I was inserted into this situation, you know, what would my next move be? You know, don't worry about blaming yourself for getting here, yeah. you know, pretend you're inserted into this difficult Mission Impossible situation in a video game and what might next move be. You're going to say something, Scott. It's Pluto, man. Oh, it's not anymore. Uh, it actually got re I, I think it got it's re It's been in the news lately. It's a dwarf yeah. planet. Yeah, but... it's going to be in somehow, but you've just got dropped yeah. from a planet to test. Yeah, that's like those people that call the moon a planet. Exactly. I feel like an idiot now. Just to say that. That's why you have to surround yourself with good people. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Coming out. Sorry. I didn't know that. No, that thought. Continue. Yeah, the, uh, the other thing I was going to say is you said surround yourself with, you know, if you don't have money, it's because you're not surrounding yourself with the right people. And that's true, too. I was, I was at a having a drink with somebody the other day, a couple friends, just two random people, and I was saying, hey, you know what, think about starting another gym, I've, uh, I've invested in gyms before, sold it, and you know, my friend and I that did that are doing another one. Mm -hmm. And these two random friends of mine that I happen to be hanging out with, they're good friends, but they both, yeah, you know, I want in, you know, and it was not a small amount of money, but you know, right there, just an offhand comment, it's about weeding, more about weeding out people to do business with than yeah. trying to find people. You know, and if you're surround, if you're well networked and you surround yourself with the right people, then you shouldn't have a problem raising yeah. capital. Now that it's easy to say when you're already well networked, but yeah. you know, making friends with good people and trying to find people that are intellectually engaging and trying to, you know, Scott, like you always say, trying to better themselves mm -hmm. is uh, is an important thing. And, and I want to touch on that real quick. How do you go into a new uh, environment where you don't know anything about about uh, whatever industry you're moving into. Let's say just because we're talking about real estate, you, you want to go to uh, to a, a real estate networking event, but you don't know anything about uh, real estate. Well, there's this whole idea of being interesting and being interested. Well, when you go to networking events, you you don't care about who you are. All you care about is how much can you get to know about other people and how can you add value to their life. Right. You want to be so interested in what they're doing and ask them so many questions. And if you walked up to someone and asked them a hundred questions about them, but you, it, they were genuine and you were really interested and, and the questions were building on each other and you were actually paying attention and you never said one thing about you other than maybe your name, that person that you're talking to would walk away thinking, wow, that's such a great guy. I love talking with him. When they they won't even realize that you were in control of the entire conversation. You made it specifically about them the entire time. And you do that enough times with enough people, you will you will get people that want to help you. And you'll eventually you'll meet one guy over here at this group and one guy over here at this group and you'll find out one guy does something and another guy needs something and you can put them in touch and you can start adding value to other people. And the important thing is not looking to see how can you get paid for this right away. It's looking to see how many people can you help because when you help enough people, the money will follow. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, that's the, that's the whole philosophy behind our, our business development at O'Flaherty mm -hmm. Law is finding, you know, going to groups, yeah. meeting people, learning about them, and finding ways that we can add value to them other than just giving them a referral. Mm -hmm. Because we can't, we don't have enough referrals to go, go around yeah. all of our referral partners. We can certainly put people in contact mm -hmm. with each other and help them out. And, sure. and you know, that makes you feel good, it makes them feel good, yeah. and it makes you at the forefront of their mind and, and they, they feel like, you know, hey, this guy just helped me out with something, he cares about me, I want to help him out with something. Exactly. So you're brilliantly said and I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. Uh, so uh, other than there being a lot of money to be had right mm -hmm. now and, you know, the, the world being generally at peace, are there any other reasons you think now as opposed to, you know, 2011 or, you know, like three years now. It, yeah, it's a great time to, to do business. Um, so, the biggest thing is the fact that right now companies still offer benefits, right? 
Now, all of a sudden, when everyone gets stripped to being an independent contractor, who knows when that will be, right? But the idea is you want to be ahead of the, ahead of the game. You don't want to be trying to be an entrepreneur when there's 10, 10 million more people trying to be an entrepreneur. You know, you're never going to get this moment back. You're never going to get today back. You're never going to be as young as you are right now. You're never going to have as much energy as you, well, maybe, depending on how you take care of yourself. But the idea is, <laughs> the, the idea is, though, you know, you always want to be aware of what's happening in the world and, and where things are going, and you want to try and be ahead of, ahead of the trend. And you, you, you go back 150 years ago, well, 95% of the, of the people in the world had their own business. And now it's, it's, it's the opposite. It's growing. You know, there's more than, it's, it's, it's better than it was 20 years ago. But people need to take responsibility for their life and for their family and quit blaming things on others. Don't, it doesn't matter what the economy does because if you have the knowledge there was more people that made more money in 2009, 2000 and 2008, 2010 than they made their entire life. I mean, and that's just because they had the knowledge to capitalize on that. And, you know, the real estate market, like every other industry, it works in bubbles where things appreciate, things appreciate, things appreciate, and values go up, and all of a sudden they, they're not, they're at an unsustainable height, and they pop, and that bubble pops, and prices drop. And if you look at real estate over the last 60 years, you'll see that trend where prices go up, they drop, they go up, they drop. But you'll see an overall trend where over the course of 10 years, they continue to rise. And, you know, people are motivated by, by two basic needs, uh, fear and pleasure. And when I ask people, how do you think the majority of people make their decisions? Um, you know, normally it's a, it's, a, it's a good environment where I'm talking with people and it's a positive conversation. I like to keep things positive. So they'll be in a good mood and they'll say, oh, they want to be happy. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Most people are motivated by fear. And when you look at all the people that, that sell stocks when there, there's, a, there's a bubble that popped, well, if all those people that sold their stocks in 2008 would have kept them, well, now they'd be worth way more. For the, for the most part, generally speaking, you know, I'm, I'm listening to a book, book by, about Warren Buffett right now, and his whole approach to investing in anything is long-term. He looks at it in uh, minimum one-year cycles. And he's, he doesn't care about the quarterly report. Um, and, and so many people who, you know, just to use the stock market as an example, you've got, app, you've got a phone app, you know, you can check it on your computer. People are checking stocks, you know, three times, a, three times a day. They're driving in their car, they're waiting in line somewhere, and they're, and they're just becoming so emotionally interbulated because of what the stock market's doing. When, when you do your research on a company, you, you should be able to see what direction it's going in if you study the, the annual reports for the last five years. And, you know, it just, it just goes back to saying that you have to take responsibility for your life. And 10 years from now, it's going to be no one's fault but yours, wherever you are. Whether that's good or bad, it's going to be completely your fault because you were responsible for the decisions that got you there. And there is no better way, more, no more exciting way to take control of your life than to start your own business and to do something you're passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about life, if you haven't figured out what your purpose is, you're not living. You're going through the motions. And it's, it's, it's not a way to wake up in the morning and just think, oh, great. You know, I love Mondays. Mondays to me are so exciting because it's the start of a new week where I get to create something. And I'll go, I'll check my Facebook and see all these people talking about how negative things are and how bad this is and they got red lights on the way to work. Well, I love getting red lights because I get to listen to my book on tape a little bit longer because I, I want to be learning everywhere I go. And, you know, it's... I like Mondays, it's, too. Yeah. I love your attitude. I think it's a, it's a really positive thing. You've said a lot of things that I, I completely agree with. Uh, the... The idea of everyone becoming independent contractors under that's something I learned the hard way. I was an associate at I was the only associate at a two partner law firm and they were older guys. I'm like, you know what, if I just ride this out, eventually I'm pretty much guaranteed to be a partner and yep. you know, I got laid off when the recession happened and you know, we talked about in episode four with Ken Adams, Don't yep. Be a Job Zombie, that this is kind of a good companion episode yep. to this one. We we talked about that job security is, you know, is False. You know, there, there's you've got more security running your own business and yeah. more control over it. 
so than true. And going into work thinking you're going to be with that company for the next 30 years because you're yeah. not. Yeah, and I've had people come to me and go, so that's so scary. You have your own businesses. You do that. That's so scary. I'm like, <laughs> you've been fired three times in the last two years. I know that because I know you. <laughs> I've never been fired yeah. from my own business anyway. <laughs> but how do, you, how do you say mine's scary and yours is not? Yeah. It, it, it is easier to, uh, it, it's taking ownership. Mm -hmm. And if you take ownership and you go, I'm not going to be scared of the fact that I may lose my job because I own it. it I'll know at least ahead of time if it's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a funny world we live in where it's getting to where... Everyone's their own brand. Everyone's yeah, it's, their own like, brand. it's like a pro athlete might play for sports team, but he's like, Personal he says branding. it's business and I got to work yep. on my brand, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it's... Yeah. And, and, you know, with, with Obamacare and the fact that people can get health insurance, you know, a lot of people look at it negatively. I look at it positively. I have a pre-existing condition. I was able to like, go out, start my business, get insurance, and I can tell my employees, you know what? I'm, I'm not necessarily going to provide health insurance because you can get it now on the open market and that's not a precondition for, you know, a job. There's a lot of employers that aren't providing it anymore. Yep. Same with, you know, 401ks. You pay a wage and, you know, you earn that wage. And, and the way we have our, our employment structure set up is that a, a lot of people are paid on what they produce, and if they don't produce anything, yep. they don't make anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way the world is moving, and I, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. No, I actually agree with that, because if you're paying two people the same salary and one person works harder than the other, is that fair? I don't think so. No. I, I think it's a failing system, and I think it's going to fail sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's funny, I always look at... Uh, you look at the general store back in the old west, back in those days, everybody you know, you went to a store got everything. Mm -hmm. And then somehow we shifted to this thing where we have a Walmart or whatever. And then, then we sh we're shifting back to this thing. And I, I think it's cyclical and, and everybody, no matter which generation you're from, you're mad that, oh, but I like the mom and pop stuff. I kind of think Walmart's cool or Target or whatever it is. And, Costco. And, 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 yeah, and Costco. And then that's a new one. But now it's, I think it's going back to the whole like uh, small people stuff. Mm -hmm. but the general store was a Walmart of the day way back in the time. Mm -hmm. But then some people hate Walmart. It's all cyclical as it relates to business today. You're right about like whatever you do, people are going to make the decisions. And they're going to go, I, if only it had been, I'd done it 10 years ago. Yeah. But if we're moving forward 10 years from now, Maybe it won't be Walmart. Maybe it'll be like not the general store, which is what Walmart is. Maybe it'll be individual spaces or whatever. But your decisions, you have to make them, and you have to move forward. Yeah. And and, and know that the decisions you make are important, but mm -hmm. you, you can't look backwards. Yeah, and, and thinking about properties as it really is properties ten years ago, way cheaper than now. Of course. But I can buy them now, and ten years I'll be going. I could have bought them ten years ago, way cheaper. Mm -hmm. And inflation is going to happen. Yeah, of course. And don't be scared to make decisions. You know, decisions, you're not always going to be right. And people are so scared of being yeah. wrong that they don't make decisions. Absolutely. Be decisive. If you study any successful person on successful on a large scale, they're decisive. They are decisive individuals and they made mistakes. But you make a decision right now. It's zero time with the data you have in front of you. A second later, you might have more data. And then you make a new decision. And you just go about your day making decisions, making decisions, making decisions. And to me, that's so logical. And most people, they'll get stuck on a maybe. And they'll hem and they'll ha, and they're not sure. And they'll want to talk to this guy. And they need to think about it. Thinking, that's, that's BS. You know, at zero time, you know what the right thing to do is. And then you invalidate your knowingness by, by saying, I need to think about it. And, and when you look at the people who are running multiple companies, they don't have the luxury of sitting around and thinking about it. And it's because their necessity level has increased that their success level also increases with it because they, they take thought out of decisions and they just make decisions based on data and they're not emotional about it. That's a really good point and that's something that I fail at a lot. I, I often want to do a... When I know what the right decision is, I will often want to see if an employee will correct their behavior first before dropping the hammer. And, and I do that too much. You know, I, I know that I, I, there's a policy I want to institute, but I've said, you know what, here's the correction I want to see. Mm -hmm. And then I'll let it drag out for a month before, you know, yeah. having the, the stones to institute that policy. Where, you know, so I, as a personal, you know, it's a personal failing of mine. I could probably be more decisive and just say, now wait for the person to fail and just say, all right, this is this is a policy shift we don't we made. I don't need an excuse 
to yep. make the policies. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, you know I, I I've studied a lot about business, gone to dozens and dozens of seminars, learning from people that run multiple companies, and you know it's this funny thing where you you a company is a group, and a group needs to work together as a team, right? And you all need to be working towards a common purpose, and every individual in a company has a product they're creating, all to create the the greater product of the company, right? So everyone has these individual roles, and people's intention is often different from their result, sure. right? And it's it's important to validate the intention, but but invalidate the result. If people are doing something that's not working and you know it needs to change, you say, okay, I know that you're working really hard. I know that, that you're doing the best you can, but let's look at these results over here. And now all of a sudden it's you and the employee on, on a team versus the results. And you're now working really together yeah. to get a better result. And now they're willing to, 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 and now, you know, they know you understand. Because if you invalidate the intention, they put up a wall. Yeah. And they, they put up that wall, and they all of a sudden want to find a way to make you wrong. And you're now on opposite ends. And you, you put your hand up against mine. Push really hard. So much stronger than I am. <laughs> so so the, the point is that that's force counter force. You don't get anywhere. Yeah. Right? Well, so, uh, you're, you're getting somewhere, but you're, you're six by six. So. <laughs> okay, so now, now push. Uh, yeah. now push really hard. Yep. So when you all of a sudden take force out of management, there's there's nothing to push back against, mm -hmm. and eventually they'll, they'll, they'll work with you. So if you are just validating intention and invalidating result and working as a team with the employee to, to get a better result, and, and, it's, and, and they have to know their purpose in the company. People... They, they, you know, in school, the reason why people think kids have ADD is because, number one, they, they don't understand words. They're not defining all the words that are being used. They're confused. Number two, they don't have a purpose. They have no idea why they have to learn this stuff other than mommy said I had to be there, right? So people forget that no, finding your purpose in life is, is extremely important. And, doing, and if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you're not going to have the drive to go the extra mile. You're not going to do what it takes to get the result no matter what. And so, you know, helping people find their purpose and having them identify verbatim what is your product, what are you creating, what is the exact result you want to achieve, and then setting daily targets to get there. Yeah, that's, you know what, I, I could talk to you for two hours, <laughs> but uh, we've already gone 10 minutes over. So, Chris, thank you so much for being here. You've, you've, uh, this is one of our better episodes. I think we've uh, yeah. gotten a lot of wisdom out of you, and, and I, uh, I think you know what you're doing. Um, someone wants to work with you and maybe be a uh, joint venture partner mm -hmm. with you or go, yep. attend one of your seminars. How can they reach you? So my email is chris at icandyhomes.com. That's the letter I-C-A-N-D-Y-H-O-M-E-S. Um, feel free to reach out to me anytime. And I, I would love to set up a meeting. Uh, I can let you know about some of our free and low-cost events and see, you know, get to know you a little better, figure out what your purpose is, why are you interested in real estate, and see if we'd be a good fit to work together.